So how do you build a perfect watch collection? Well, you really can't, but you can try your best to do so. And that is the purpose of this video and the continuation of this series, building a perfect watch collection at a variety of different price ranges here today with $11,000. So if you're new to this concept, what we do here is we try to map out with different personas, ways of collecting different philosophies and develop specific collections for those different types of personas to show how you can spend the certain dollar amount specified by the video. Here today, we're going to be looking at the price tier of $11,000. Before we look at the personas themselves, just a few ground rules here to begin. We're going to be looking at contemporary watches, so no crazy vintage pieces because that can get crazy and we'll just open up a can of worms I don't wanna necessarily get into in this. Also, we're gonna be looking at retail prices or so future-proof this so that people don't get mad at me if I say something is available for this amount of money and then it's no longer available for that in the future. Also, there will be a few instances where we are cutting our collection close to the exact amount of $11,000. Don't come after me if we do that. I try my best. Math isn't my best subject. It never was my best subject, but we're gonna to try to keep it as close as possible. Just, you know, give me the benefit of the doubt here. But now let's go through each one of our personas. Persona one is the one watch collection. This type of person tries their best to find the one watch that can meet all of their needs and finds joy in the simplicity of reaching for the same watch every day. For persona two, we have the check off the boxes individual. This is the type of collector that needs to have a watch for every scenario even if one of those scenarios never happens. For Persona 3, we have the hipster, and this is the type of collector that can't stand to have anything mainstream in those times when they're not perfecting their pour over method for their coffee. They're spending the majority of their time picking out boutique watches and micro brands to show others how in the know they are. Persona 4, this is the on trend individual. So this is a collector that takes inspiration from popular media, celebrities, and any other person that can lessen the research required to make a decision. Ultimately, they like what is popular and enjoy safe choices. For Persona 5, we have the perfect duo. This collector likes simplicity, but doesn't want to have to settle for just one watch. So they opt for the balance of a dress piece and a sports everyday time piece. And finally, we have the minimalist for Persona 6. This collector enjoys watches that simply do what is necessary while seeking a middle ground of function and beauty. And since this video is gonna be looking at all these different watches that you can buy. I think one of the most important considerations every collector should know is what watch sizes work best for their wrist size. So down below, we have a comprehensive guide on considerations just to think about when it comes to nailing the right size watch for your wrist. We talk about just general measurements, also dial the bezel ratio and other specific things to consider when looking to buy a watch that is going to be appropriate for your wrist size. Again, of course, it's all open to your subjective point of view, but this is probably a helpful guide just to consider when looking to buy. We also have a video on that article that goes through some good side-by-sides to show how a watch will wear on a variety of different wrists. So you have even more of an understanding of this concept. Link will be in the description down below. To kick us off here, this is Persona 1, the one watch collection. So this is the type of individual that's all about maximizing their budget. I totally identify with this type of collector and I think more people should try their best to do this more often than not. But in the case of $11,000, it is kind of a tricky price range because many brands, and at least what I've noticed is, they'll settle just under nine to $10,000 right in that range because there is something about once you see five digits next to a dollar sign, it does start to freak people out even more because it's a lot of money. Uh, but for $11,000, there still are some very good options. Now, probably one of the best no-brainer picks would be the Rolex GMT Master II. I have a video talking about this watch as saying it might be the best contemporary sports Rolex nowadays, and I gave some reasons why that's the case. I'm not going to be able to go through all the details why this watch is special, but it really does represent what a GMT watch is from a modern point of view. In addition to that, you're dealing with the history of 1954 Pan Am Pilots, the bicolor bezel design, fit and finish, and of course the Rolex name at retail pricing just under $11,000. This watch is simply phenomenal. One of my favorites that Rolex makes. And by the way, the uh, best configuration is on the Jubilee. I'm willing to argue that point till the end, but no, some people will disagree. Another watch that I'll mention here is the Zenith Chronomaster Sport. A lot of talk about the Daytona when looking at this watch, and for good reason, it does look like a Daytona. The weird thing about this watch though, and just Zenith in general, is the fact that the El Primero movements were housed within the Daytona for a decade, or over a decade, and that does create a weird 
scenario that pretty much any other brand that is maybe pulling some uh, from the design of another watch can't really own themselves. But the Chronomaster Sport brings a lot to the table beyond just the looks. Wearable case at 41 millimeters, but a very compact lug to lug, just under 46 millimeters, water resistance of 100 meters. But the big reason why this watch is special is the movement on the inside. This is the El Primero 3600. The 3600 does utilize the five Hertz operation frequency. But what's really cool about these is it does track a 10th of a second. So you'll see this being utilized across the board in many new Zenith watches. And seeing that second hand move quickly around the dial is pretty cool to see in action. I'll throw two more honorable mentions in here as well. $11,000, not as much available to you as 10,000, 9,000, but two other brands here. First will be JLC. I'll look at the Master Ultra Thin Moon. This is one of their most underrated watches. I love the Master Ultra Thin Moon. It's right up there with pretty much any Reverso for me in terms of their entire catalog. If you've not seen my video touring JLC and their manufacturer, I would highly recommend it. I think you'll gain much more appreciation for this brand, what they were able to develop and pretty much every every major high horology brand at some point in their history throughout the early 20th century, it seemed like they were having movements produced by JLC. There's a reason why they call this brand the watchmaker's watchmaker. And there really truly aren't brands nowadays that are manufacturing components, assembling movements, and cases all in one house. They are a manufacturer to the highest degree. And another brand I'll have to mention here is Glass Huta Original with the CQ Panorama Date. GO in some aspects is almost the equivalent to JLC from a German watchmaking perspective. They have watches that start under $10,000, but then they'll do high horology pieces and some true artisanal uh, creations when they're movement production. Very much slept on brand. The CQ probably though is the most viable for people in this range just because of what it's bringing to the table on the sports side. This is like a luxury German vehicle version of a dive watch. It is simply beautiful. The movement finishing on the 3613 is stunning. It has a Sapphire exhibition case back that is also boxed, which is very strange to see in a dive watch, but it also doesn't create any weird feeling on the wrist when you have it on. You do have the general CQ at 39 and a half millimeters if you don't wanna go for the larger pan Ram a date. But since this is $11,000, let's jump up there, make that our consideration. Beautiful brand, artisanal movements, and a lot of bang for buck if you are a true horological enthusiast. Now for Persona 2, we have the check off the boxes. Again, this is somebody that wants to think about every possible living scenario and we'll create a watch that can represent that scenario and be viable in that circumstance. So first we have the everyday casual option. So this is something that can be worn you know, casually out and about. And here we have the Tudor Pelagos 39, pretty safe choice, uh, but is going to be that just dumb reach type of watch where you just don't wanna think about what can I wear today? This is one of these options that I think just comes to mind. I do think the 39 was probably more viable for a wide variety of situations. So that's why I'm leaning into this one compared to the 42 millimeter option. This was the release from Tudor in later of last year. You saw all the watches and wonders releases and then here comes this watch out of nowhere. And it turned out to be probably my favorite release from the brand all year. 39 millimeter case, 11.8 millimeters in thickness, lug to lug just south of 47 millimeters, titanium case to go along with it, 200 meters of water resistance, not quite to the standard standard of the full size Pelagos, but still more than what is required. And then an MT 5400 caliber on the inside, COSC certified, checks off the boxes when it comes to specifications and checks off the box here for our casual watch. For our dress category, we have an interesting piece from Oris called the Oris James Morrison. So this is a minimalist dress watch from the brand that honors Australian jazz musician, James Morrison. But I love the, just the tie-in. It's very simple in its approach. I love the numeral design and the golden hue of the hands as well as that counterweight. That counterweight is designed with intention. It is made to resemble a trumpet hook, which is a cool, small, little subtle tie-in. Sometimes brands go a little bit over the top and over branding something, but this is so layered within the details that I think it's very well executed. 38 millimeter case wears relatively true to that size despite having a very thin outer bezel. The down color is this vivid blue black will change on the lighting conditions and a reliable Sleeta SW200 movement that is going to be modified to some effect and get that custom red rotor that has now become so much affiliated with Oris. Now for our complication here, this is where we can stretch into GMTs, chronographs, anything of the sort. I'm gonna go with the chronograph just given where we fall in price. And for chronographs around $3,000, a liter is Longines without question. Here we have the record chronograph from the brand. Longines is a brand that is underestimated when it comes to 
chronographs, as well as just a brand in general. I did a video where I actually toured Longines Museum. Highly recommended if you are sleeping on this brand, want to learn more about them because you could argue one of the most important historic brands in the history of watchmaking, and that is not being overly emphatic, is true. When you're talking about chronographs specifically, they were producing chronographs in wristwatches in the early 1900s, before even wristwatches were a thing. We didn't see that become popularized until after World War I. They had watches in the early 1910s with a chronograph. In addition to that, them and Breitling were battling out for the first flyback chronograph in a wristwatch. So there are a lot of things that Longines can own. They have one of the most beautiful chronograph movements of all time with the 13ZN. And this one follows a lot of those vintage inspired types of approaches, beautiful, layout for the registers at a A31 caliber on the inside. This is a movement that is gonna be used for Longines. They assembled their movements on site, which is another important consideration. Some brands would call that in-house, and I think you can get away with calling it that because they are part of the broader swatch group. Proprietary movements without question. Case size 40 millimeters, so where it's very good for a automatic chronograph. 47 millimeter lug to lug to help it wear true to that size, if not slightly smaller. And thickness is not unreasonable too, 13.8 millimeters. And now for our final watch, we have our beater. And here we have the Certina DS PH500M. So Certina is a brand when it comes to dive watches that deserves more recognition. They've been around since 1888, but when it comes to dive watches, they really became famous in 1969 with the Tech Type Project, where a team of scientists and divers spent two months in an underwater laboratory. It also was known as being the issued watch for some lucky Royal Australian Navy divers in the 1970s. Their DS concept was also remarkable. It basically created a shroud around the movement to create a floating type atmosphere to help against shocks. It also had a unique crown system to help with water resistance. And this PH500M is in many ways their vintage pro diver that just looks great. It's 43 millimeters in diameter, but it does not wear to that size with that 48 millimeter lug to lug, bringing in some of that Seiko like effect when it comes to wearing smaller than the case size might indicate. And as the name would also suggest, 500 meters of water resistance. Ah, so probably my favorite persona on this list, or at least it's always one of my favorite personas when we do this. This is the hipster. Let's kick it off with a dress-oriented watch, and we're going to have the Volcane Cricket tradition. Now, the Volcane Cricket is a watch that you could argue is iconic. It is a watch that is known as the President's Watch. It was released in 1947. It popularized the concept of alarm watches. Yes, there were brands that were trying alarm wristwatches beforehand, but this was the watch that allowed it to be done at scale effectively without having to worry about the thing breaking. How they were able to go around this was the barrel system. So they created two separate barrels and two different ways of winding the crown to allow power to go directly to the alarm. And then also having another barrel that was going to power the timekeeping. It was worn by presidents like Harry Truman, I believe first. And then it was following down all the way till modern presidents. Lyndon B. Johnson actually wore it and loved the watch so much that he gifted it to over like 200 people. So this was like a default gift in his life that he would just hand people because he just loved the cricket so much. But really why this watch is special is its alarm. Now recently this brand was relaunched and it does have its own proprietary movement. You have the V10 on the inside. It follows the function of the original calibers powering the cricket with some modern spec involved. I have a full video on this one coming out. So you know, stay tuned because I just love this watch. I love the way it looks. I love how they were able to stay true to the original. And yes, this is a brand that some people of course are going to know about. It's not so in the weeds, but it is still one that probably doesn't get the recognition that it deserves in the modern era. Because when you're talking about alarm watches, I think of the Memovox and I think of the Cricket. Those are the two. In very similar fashion, this is a watch that I simply love. This is the complication category underneath the hipster umbrella. And this is the Christopher Ward Bel Canto. Full video on this watch. I was a little bit late to the party in covering these because I was not able to get my hands on one for some time, but uh, count me as absolutely on the bandwagon. These are remarkable watches and the ingenuity taking place here is hard to be matched at pretty much almost any level in the industry. And I know that is a crazy statement to make, but what makes this watch so unique to me is the fact that it's under $4,000 and you're getting a sonnery au passage, a chiming mechanism for a watch. They basically took what they were doing for their jump hour module and shifting that into a chime that would go off every single hour. Easier said than done. It was a long process. I'd recommend checking out my video down below, but 
this watch looks the part. It's using a complication that you will never see in a watch under $10,000, or at least you don't see very often. I think there's a couple examples in the industry. I mean, Meister Singer, who, by the way, has a connection to Christopher Ward and who's producing some of their watches. So very kind of weird dynamic there, but that is one of the only other examples you're going to find. 41 millimeter case, we're smaller than that with the grade five titanium. Yes, grade five titanium. Also having over 60 components added to the module to allow this chiming to take place. Yes, the looks are going to be a bit out there, but the reason why this watch is special is not anything other than just the fact that it's doing something unique for the price category that is almost unprecedented in the industry. For our diver watch in the hipster category, Doxa Sub 300. Doxa Sub 300, it gets kind of a weird rap just because people see these funky orange dials and don't understand the history of this brand. This is one of the brands that was responsible for popularizing colorful dials. And it wasn't for just making a statement. It was done with actual utility in mind. They were testing out different dive watches in Lake Neuchâtel in the 1960s, and they were trying to identify what would allow the best visibility underwater. The orange professional dial was the one that came out on top, and that became a staple for Doxa for years to come. The watch made such an impression, it even was on the wrist of Jacques Cousteau and some of his crew members. So if you're talking about getting a nice tip of the cap from a dive watch category, it doesn't really get much better than that. The Doxa Sub 300 is the wash when you're thinking of Doxa. This is what put them on the map in many ways. Modern creation is 42 millimeters, 13.3 millimeters in thickness, a lug to lug of 45 millimeters. So getting that Seiko turtle type effect here, wears like a 40 millimeter watch on wrist, 300 meters of water resistance, ETA 2824, but it is COSC certified. Watches that aren't gonna be for everybody, but if you understand the history, understand why they're cool, a lot more to like about. Now we don't have much money left in this category. So we're gonna go for something that's more of a beater. And this is the Autodromo Group C. For a watch that is more of the digital variety, I do think that the price here is ambitious, but in terms of appealing to that hipster fancy, I mean, this is, come on, this is exactly right up the alley here. $475, again, ambitious price, but I think these look fantastic. 36 millimeters, it wears less like a Casio and more like a regular analog watch, if that makes any sense. They did a nice job with the case structure and how it wears. It's inspired by Group C rally cars from the 1980s to the early 1990s. If you're not familiar with Autodromo, their whole concept is bringing back that ethos aligned with retro race cars and uh, automobiles from the 20th century. They do a very nice job with it and making it still feel very authentic. It has an LCD with a blue backlight, sapphire crystal with AR, looks the part. And again, come on, can't you imagine some hipster wearing this thing? It's just, it absolutely fits. Now for Persona 4, again, we have the on trend. And just to reiterate the whole concept here, this is for somebody that is, just likes following what's popular, also likes the safe choices. It's not to say that any of the watches here are bad because I actually own two of the watches in this category. So that's not what I'm saying at all. It's just, you know, we're playing some fun. This is all fun and games. Don't take this too personally. This is all what this is about, just showing the different paths you can have here. To begin though, we probably go with one of the more on-trend watches you can go after, and that is the Rolex Oyster Perpetual, specifically the turquoise blue dial. Some people go ahead and call this the Tiffany dial, which I know for some out there makes their just blood boil and they hate that word. And they, you know, that's like the name that should not be named in the world of dial colors. Uh, but it is an accurate representation of what this dial color is. Uh, this is the 12 6000. It retails at $6,100 at 36 millimeters. Lots of like with this robust movement on the inside. The bracelet is class leading for the price category. And it is pretty much the most entry level door to get into the crown nowadays, but that is at retail pricing. The reason why I wanted to put it on this list is because this $6,000 watch trades like two or three X. And I think that's rather disgusting, but hey, you know, everybody has things that they like. They decide to spend how, their money how they wanna spend it. Uh, but no doubt this is a very cool watch. I like the looks, Oyster Perpetual, phenomenal watch, especially if you can get it at retail. Next we have the Tudor Black Bay 58. Has there been one watch that has caught on in terms of hype like the Tudor Black Bay in the past five years? The 58 was I think a big reason for filling out the full part of the catalog for the Black Bay. I think the 58 also is a bit more true to the original Tudor Submariners in terms of what they were going for and their sizing and how they just feel on wrist. Original was released back in 2018. I think still, even to this day, that one still feels the most true to the original concept of the Black Bay. I, I think the gilt 
is great. And that's coming from somebody that owns the Navy version. I just like the old Tudor Submariners in blue. But Tudor Black Bay 58, phenomenal watch. Uh, I'm a big fan of it. I have championed this watch for quite some time. I own one of the watches uh, and a great watch if you're just starting to get into the world of luxury watches in general. It's almost in a way, one of the gateways uh, to that world. So we used up the majority of our budget with those first two watches. So let's spend a little bit less money in these next two. You know I have to do this. The Moon Swatch. Swatch Omega, Moon Swatch. Now you could do the mission to Moonshine Gold, which that was uh, you know, a little bit deflating in terms of how much hype was associated with that to eventually what we got with just a change in the second hand. But, but how can you talk about this concept of on trend and not mention this watch? Released in 2022, March of 2022, and was able to completely pull the rug out of Watches and Wonders in some way. I mean, I remember going to Watches and Wonders last year and people were still talking about the Moon Swatch. That was still the talk of the town, even week or so after the release. And this is with Rolex releasing all their new product, Cartier releasing all their new product, Patek releasing all their new product. They were able to totally own the industry for a short period of time. And even to this point in 2023, still is a very popular watch. It allowed Swatch and Omega to see the biggest surge in search traffic for both the Omega Speedmaster and Swatch as a brand in the last 20 years of Google Trend Data, which is remarkable to think about. So it did the job. Is that to say it's the perfect watch and everybody should own one? No, and did potentially Swatch screw up in some ways in, turning, in terms of setting expectations, maybe on how they're going to be sold, availability, and maybe just drop the ball a couple of times? Yes, I think so too. So it is a polarizing watch, but no question an important watch in the past few years, and maybe one of the most important watches when you're talking about mass uh, you know, culture and you know how it was able to have an effect. And finally, we have the SSK GMTs from Seiko. Love these watches. I think they are phenomenal. I think they provide amazing value, but very much popular and very much should be. I think what they are able to bring to the table is remarkable. Totally redefine what a mechanical GMT offering can be under $500. Now with these movements becoming available to micro brands, we're going to see more and more adopt this type of technology in GMTs under $500. But these are the watches that allowed all of this to take place. 42 and a half millimeters with case size, wears like a 40 millimeter on wrist with that lug to lug of 46 millimeters, has the Seiko SKX effect if you've ever worn any of those watches, 100 meters of water resistance and that 4R34 movement on the inside. Now for our next persona, we have the perfect duo, one dress, one sports, you could absolutely argue that the dress watch that I'm going to state could be a sports watch as well. And you would be probably correct. And actually you would be correct. You could absolutely have some sports viability here, but we have the Cartier Santos Dumont. This watch famously comes from a lineage of watches from the Santos line that really was a pioneer in the world of wristwatches. Where this watch gets its name is from Alberto Santos Dumont. He was an heir to a Brazilian coffee growing empire and a pioneer of aeronautical pursuits in the early 20th century in Paris, famously flying around the Eiffel Tower in 1901. Now, Louis Cartier befriended him. They would hang out quite frequently and Dumont explained the annoyance of flying with a pocket watch and being able to tell the time. So in 1904, Cartier produced the Cartier Santos Dumont for Alberto Santos Dumont. Seven years later, they have made it available to the public and the rest is essentially history. This follows that lineage, classic design, timeless as can be. I think it's simply phenomenal in terms of how it wears, how it looks. It epitomizes class, but also has sporty upside. When I think of class in the 21st century, this watch hasn't aged it, it at all in a hundred years of being available. It is still as great today as it was years ago in terms of being viable for a wide variety of people and really just being that one watch if you needed it to be. In this case though, I'm gonna have it in the dress category because it can do the job on that side as well. And now for our sports, we have the Omega Aquaterra Green 41. So last year we saw the Omega Aquaterras with those new colorways at 38 millimeters. Now I noticed that those were not becoming available for quite some time. I actually have a reason and I think a thought to why that actually is the case. I noticed that they might be changing the date windows on those watches. So I think that may have had a reason why the production was slow there. A lot of people are thinking that they're doing the whole Rolex thing. I don't know if that's the case. This is just what I've seen, but I'm gonna actually look at instead the traditional 41 millimeter green teak wood style dial that has been in the collection for a little bit longer. The reason why I wanted to focus on these is because they offer up some great value. You're talking about, yes, a 41 millimeter case, 47.5 millimeter lug to lug, whereas like a 40 and a half on wrist, water resistance of 150 meter, you're getting that Meta certified movement. But the interesting thing here is that 
it comes with an 8900 movement. Now, there are some other Aquaterras that have the 8800, the difference being that the 8900 is going to have different function when pulling the crown to the second position, isolated hour function, and gets two barrels. In many ways, it is a superior movement. So, and you're also getting a fair price less than some of the 8800 powered Aquaterras on the market. Perhaps a concept that is lost on some collectors and people looking at the Aquaterra collection, but a good point to think about when looking to buy one. And now for our final category, we have the Minimalist. To kick us off here, we have a Grand Seiko watch, one of my favorites from the brand. This is the SBGY. 007, also known as the Omi Watari. So this watch retails at $8,300 but it brings a lot to the table in terms of elevated stature compared to some of the other offerings from Grand Seiko. For one, it's beautiful to look at. The dial is going to be inspired by water of Lake Sua when it freezes over. Simply stunning to look at with its mild texture. It's there once you get into the details, but it's not so over the top. It's just is enough to be discovered and to be excited when you do so. 38 millimeters with this case and it wears very true to that size. Compact on the wrist as well. The other reason why I like this watch is just how thin it is. 10.2 millimeters while coming with a manual caliber spring drive on the inside, the 9R31. This movement also comes with the power reserve indicator on the reverse side. Some people like the power reserve indicator. Some people don't like the power reserve indicator. Well, you kind of get the best of both worlds here. You don't have it on the dial. So for those that don't like it, you don't have to worry about that and breaking up the symmetry of the dial. But in addition to that, if you are somebody that does like the power reserve, you still have that with view on the back to see where your power reserve is at. Pretty useful also for a manual wound watch. Movement with that 9R31 comes with the standard conventional but exceptional range of deviation for the Grand Seiko Spring Drive, plus or minus one second per day. Usually we'll outperform that by a far margin, plus or minus 15 seconds per month is the average. Phenomenal watch, some of Grand Seiko's finest work. And for the minimalist category, I didn't think it made sense to go past two watches in this instance. So for our next watch, we have the Nomos Tangente 38 millimeter. So the Tangente is slightly smaller than 38 millimeters if you measure it from side to side, but it wears like a 39 to 40 millimeter on wrist with that lug to lug dimension. Dial to bezel ratio does allow the dial to really stand out and be a little bit larger. But this is very much the long standing design DNA of Nomos. This design style has been around since 1992, over 30 years for this design. And it is one of the first that comes to mind for those that are fans of Nomos. Also on the inside, the alpha manual caliber. This is an in-house movement that they're producing. And the dial is as balanced and clean as you're ever going to come by in the world of watches. And in many ways, epitomizing what Nomos is all about. But all right guys, that is my list here today, looking at how you can build an $11,000 watch collection. Six different collection types, variety of different watches, if you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon. If you had to pick one of these collections that I identified, which one would you pick and why? And if you did have $11,000, if you didn't like any of them, say how you'd spend your $11,000 in the comments below. Also definitely check out teddybaldestar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer, how we're able to create all this content, fund all the productions, Brands don't pay us to create any content. How we're able to do it is through teddybaldister.com. So if you're in the market for a watch, we would absolutely love to have your business. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.